Hej och välkomna till dagens seminarium om framtidens pengar. Jag heter Anna Tullström och är moderator idag till vardags forskare här på Institutet för framtidsstudier. Och detta är alltså den andra i en serie av tre seminarier om framtidens valutaförsörjning. Det förra som hölls i oktober handlar om kontanternas historia och framtid. Och där slutar vi i att vi inte vet hur vi kommer betala i framtiden. Och därför är vi särskilt glada att välkomna tre talare idag som ska prata om tre olika aspekter eller visioner eh, alternativ för framtidens valutaförsörjning. Det är Claire Ingram Bogus, forskare vid Handelshögskolan som kommer att prata om kryptovalutor. Esther Barinaga, professor från Copenhagen Business School som ska prata om lokalvalutor. Och slutligen Björn Segendorf från Riksbanken som ska prata om Riksbankens projekt med en digital krona, e-kronan. Välkomna! Um, so I wonder how many of you own Bitcoin? Anybody here? Okay, small number. Oh, in the back there. One more. And, and other digital currencies? Hmm? Not from the Riksbank? No, no digital currencies from the Riksbank? No. Um, <laughs> and, and how many of you, of you have uh, invested in a so-called ICO or purchased tokens for, for new ecosystems? Um, nobody? Okay. Um, so maybe, yeah. Uh, that's just for my own understanding of the level of, of knowledge and understanding here, um, because these are some of the, the interesting developments that we've seen, from Bitcoin as the very first prototype, to forks of different kinds of currencies, to new applications of the underlying technological system. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What we're going to talk about in the next 15 minutes um, is I'm going to give you a little bit of background to cryptocurrencies and, and some vocabulary to talk about what it is that we're talking about here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the social systems behind uh, cryptocurrencies, at least some of them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical systems behind cryptocurrencies, discuss the strengths and weaknesses and some applications. Um, and of course, because I'm still at a university and believe that one should have homework, there's some homework at the end. Um, not really, just further reading. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> So first and foremost, a very important distinction between, on the one hand, the digital or cryptocurrencies. Um, and when we talk about those, Bitcoin is the one that um, everybody has heard of. Another very large one is called Ether, um, which is both a currency and a token. And in practice, they don't, of course, look like that. They look more like this, um, which is a hash function, which is basically that they take cryptography to reduce an amount of data into just a little technical function like that, um, which is then included in the system. Um, and then on the other hand, we have the ledger and the underlying technology that maintains records of all of the transfers of transactions or data that occur. Um, and this ledger is maintained with the help of a distributed system of computers or processing power. Um, so currency or tokens, uh, reliant on cryptography, essentially asset agnostic, because at the end of the day, when we're talking about data, it could be data around a, a financial transaction, but it could equally be the transfer of my house to Anna, or any kind of other local currency or thing that we as people give value but can be reduced to data. Um, and the value of all of those things is typically market-based. There are some variations on this, but in general, there is no central bank that guarantees the value of any of these currencies. Um, and there are very few in the way of instruments that can be used to affect the, the currency. And I'll show you why this is important in a minute. Um, and within that system, there are varying degrees of pseudonymity. So the uh, hash function here need not contain information about who you are, but it could, uh, depending on the ecosystem that we were to use. What's worth noting is Bitcoin, which is the one that most people know, is fairly anonymous. Uh, you can't identify the people involved in a transaction from this hash function, but often you can see things like IP addresses, which can be tracked back to individuals if you take enough time and effort. Um, so that's worth noting. Then, on the other hand, what we have is the infrastructure. Um, so blockchain is the best known of these. It's also often called a distributed ledger. Um, it's a ledger, but also a process whereby all of these transactions are written into a ledger. So you have a perfect record end to end of every transaction that has ever occurred. 
um, and they're verified by the computers or the processing power in the system. So that's also an important characteristic, that you have all of the transactions that have occurred essentially at your fingertips, assuming you speak cryptography, um, which is maybe a big assumption sometimes. Um, you have verification at scale because all of these computers need to have a record of all of the transactions that have occurred in order to verify your transaction. Um, they all have that data, and it means that you can't change the transactions after the fact because you can't force that change on all of the computers. You can only verify future transactions. Um, it's distributed, which means that if one computer goes down or one server goes down, the system still works. It also means that you can't hack the whole system. You can only, at best, hack a single computer. Um, and as mentioned, this means that the record is hard to change or destroy, either within the system or by hacking any single computer in the system. Um, <clears throat> and so having given you this vocabulary as to what it is that we're talking about, uh, a quick overview of the process as it looks. Let's say that's me. Um, and I'm sending money to Bjorn at the Riksbank. Um, and let's say it's in Bitcoin. Um, some of the banks have prohibitions on owning Bitcoins. The Riksbank doesn't have a prohibition on their employees owning Bitcoins, right? Okay. <laughs> what I know okay. okay, so this is a hypothetical Bitcoin. <laughs> um, and, and of course, takes, takes the form of a hash function. Um, and so that transaction... I want to have put into this ledger. And one often talks about people having wallets of their Bitcoins. Um, that's perhaps a misrepresentation because you don't actually physically hold the Bitcoin in your wallet. What happens is that you can identify yourself um, in that ledger and through essentially your private key, they can, the, the, those who look at the ledger can see all of the transactions that are linked to you that exist in the ledger. So they can see when you bought the Bitcoins and the fact that you do actually indeed, or, or in my case, that I do indeed <coughs> own the Bitcoins that I'm trying to send to Bjorn and that I haven't spent them already. Um, Bitcoins can be uh, created not just by purchase, but also by mining. And mining occurs when, as a, as a product of me sending uh, coins to Bjorn, computers compete to verify this transaction. So to verify that I have the Bitcoins um, and that they haven't been spent already. And in the process of that little competition, new Bitcoins are created as a reward for the members of the distributed system for doing that work and participating in, in the competition. Um, as a side note, it's not just the competition that affects whose transaction goes first. You can also... Um, maybe bribe is the wrong word, but send a little bit of money into the system so that uh, one of the computers or many of the computers will prioritize your transaction rather than just the transactions in the queue. So that's three ways that the currency can, or that you can obtain currency. Uh, one, by purchasing it from an exchange. Two, by the creation of new currencies as a result of mining. And three, um, by obtaining it from someone already in the system who gives you Bitcoin in order to incentivize you to prioritize their transaction. Um, and so you have this perfect record, distributed system, and, and the hash function, which is data about a transaction that has occurred, as I've just mentioned in the little overview. But this is what it looks like as the process happens. In practice, the computers look like this. Um, they don't look like the little cartoony ones that I showed up there. So this is, you can maybe see in the corner here, this is an enormous data center um, from the now defunct KNC miner, uh, which was up in Bowdoin um, up until 2015. Um, so, so really enormous. Um, and ironically, they went out of business because they weren't big enough and they couldn't compete with the Chinese who have even bigger data centers than this and cheaper electricity. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of background. When we talk about Bitcoin as the first of these many cryptocurrencies, uh, the person or people who are credited with having created it, created it are known as Satoshi Nakamoto. And we're not really sure who they are. There have been some leads, some journalistic investigations, some um, unverifiable claims. Uh, and these per people built both the currency and the prototype of the underlying initial technology, 
which they released first as a conceptual white paper and then developed a, a software user-facing inter, inter, uh, user interface in 2009 and then disappeared and left the subsequent development of both the currencies and the infrastructure to a community of enthusiasts, um, but licensed the underlying technology under an open source license, meaning that it could be forked and there could be uh, new versions of both the currency and the underlying technology created with little in the way of permissions involved. Um, the infrastructure has since been maintained by the open source community, but there have been lots of new permutations. Uh, so Ethereum, which I mentioned earlier, is one of them. Uh, some of, there, there are a large number of local currencies based on the system, um, maybe even national currencies in the future, depending on what happens. Um, and those people who maintain the Bitcoin ecosystem uh, range quite widely from the original libertarians who saw Bitcoin as untraceable cash on the internet um, to speculators who today are fairly dominant and have meant that Bitcoin, rather than being a payment method, is actually a kind of digital gold where people sit and, and store what it is that they have. Um, and these disagreements within the system have fueled the varying different forks and the varying different uh, splits from the original technology and have meant that we have, um, if I, oh, there we go, um, huge numbers of different permutations of the original Bitcoin. Uh, so some of them are, where's Zcash? Some of them are essentially clones of the original Bitcoin. Some of them are, so Steam, for example, uh, you can give micropayments for online content, blogs, that kind of thing. So all sorts of different ideas um, forking off from the original blockchain infrastructure. Um, I think in the interests of time, I'll go over strengths and weaknesses fairly quickly uh, because we've mostly talked about them. But just to highlight the end-to-end the, uh, -end record of the ledger that is there and the fact that even if one single computer goes down or is hacked, the system continues to exist. One of the major downsides is that it is very env environmentally unfriendly because they are continually verifying transactions and they have to go through the whole ledger, um, which is, takes a lot of electricity to do, um, at least in the original blockchain. Um, when we talk about the currencies, um, the, uh, I guess characteristics, which can be both strengths and weaknesses, are first and foremost that you can transfer any kind of asset. Uh, second, that there is a market-based value, which means that we affect it rather than central banks, uh, which can mean that it is incredibly volatile, but if there are sufficient numbers of transactions, can actually mean that no centralized actor can change the system. Um, and pseudonymity can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on which end of the ideological spectrum you sit. Uh, in terms of applications that we've seen over and above uh, cash on the internet and digital gold, which is fairly well developed, we've seen, for example, a blockchain-based system which has raised money to use the blockchain to do Internet of Things uh, verifications and transactions. And they raised money through what is called an ICO for a token called HDAC, uh, which is essentially a token that you use to pay for transactions on the Internet of Things. One could even call this a local currency within a technological system. So you have technical boundaries instead of geographical boundaries. Um, similarly, here in Sweden, we've seen Lantmeteriet uh, build on one of the blockchain-based systems to do housing transfers, to make that go a little bit more smoothly, but hopefully a little bit more cheaply. Um, whoopsie, that was with some Swedish actors. Uh, here is the promised uh, additional reading, uh, which you can find online. Those are hyperlinks uh, at uh, here, the slides link where all of the slides are available. Um, thank you for being here, and I look forward to talking to you later. <laughs> Uh, the local currencies and the future of money. I don't know, how, have any of you heard about local currencies before? Yeah, only here, there. And those that have heard about it, do you connect it to paper-based technologies or to digital-based technologies? Both. <laughs> both, both. 
So it's a little bit of that. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the economic ideas these local currencies and the activists that work with them are working with to then present a few examples that are going to tell us about how they're doing and how they are actually taking these monetary ideas beyond where we think we are. Uh, and then bring it back to Sweden and what has happened here. So the first ideas come actually, you can take an economics book from first year at the Handels School and then they tell you that money is actually has three main functions. One is that it is a standard unit of account. It is the thing with which, which we use to measure some sort of economic value and because of that we can compare apples and trousers or trousers with different sorts of trousers. There are other two main functions that are the ones that these activists or these local currency practitioners work with. And is one, it's money is a medium of exchange. It facilitates, because it's a standard unit of measure, we can exchange things even with each other, even if we're not interested in that. So it, it, it eases economic transaction. The other one is, is that it's a store of value. Money itself has we, are, we assign value to it that is more than the paper, if it's a bill, that it sits on, right? Money, a hundred crowns bill, the paper itself is, doesn't cost a hundred crowns, but yet we give it a hundred crown value, right? So it's a store of value. It has a, 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 because of that, we save money. These two functions, and this is where the practitioners uh, work with, this, these two functions, foster contradictory behaviors. <coughs> For it to work properly as a medium of exchange, it needs to circulate, right? For economic activity to happen, we need money circulating in the space. People wanting to spend money so that others can get it and re-spend it again. So we need people to want spending. Now, if it works properly as a store of value, you want it to have value in itself so that people want to save it. Right? And so it takes it away from circulation. Right? These two functions are contradictory or foster contradictory behavior in the users of money. Now, these practitioners say we, we, we actually are filling these two functions with one single currency in most countries or in the countries that we know of in the close proximity when we actually could have several kinds of money to serve different functions. And this is where local currencies go. Local currencies actually focus on acting as mediums of exchange. They want to promote the circulation of money so that, they're, that it feeds into economic activity. Okay? They want more people to spend their money. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And they, there are many all over the world. South America is full of community currencies. In Africa, they are coming up. And Europe is full of, of community currencies again. They were in the 30s with the Great Depression, and they're coming back now. Um, I'm going to give you only a couple of examples of how they are actually trying to promote the circulation of money. And it comes, the first one comes from Bavaria in southern Germany, and the King Hour. It's a community currency that is started by six high school students led or guided by their economics teacher. Uh, it's now. There are now over 600 users, 600,000 users actually using the King Hour, trading, changing goods and services in King Hour rather than in Euro. Uh, it's both, it's, it's, there are no public institutions supporting it. It's actually thanks to the strong community networks that there are in the region that, that the, the currency has taken such a, such a scale. Local businesses, non-profit associations, cooperative banks are supporting it. And the technology platform is mainly paper for citizens, for everyday users. Businesses are also taking a, 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 an electronic account, an electronic platform. Now, this currency is special because it's, it's backed by euros. So you, as a normal user, you go into your, the exchange point or the shop that actually changes your euros for King Hour. The idea there is that the euro can be spent outside the region. And so think about circulation, OK? And so when it's spent outside the, the region, it doesn't help our region anymore because it's not coming back. What we want is local money to circulate in the region and to circulate a lot. 
So one is dark diuros. You can buy yourself into the king hour. But there's another feature that makes it special. It's what is called demurrage or oxidation. My, my. Demurrage and oxidation comes from a currency that was uh, in use in Warble, in Austria, in the 30s, 33, I think it was 33 and 34. And when the mayor of the city, with the Great Depression, saw that the, 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 the national currency was, was not there, was leaving the region. And so they in, he introduced what we call demurrage, and is a, a taxing, a hoarding tax. So if you keep your money and then use it and store value, you know, you use it to store value, your money is going to lose value, actually. And after every month, for it to maintain its face value, one shilling at the time, you had to pay 10 cents. If you didn't have that stamp on, you, you, you couldn't use your money. So the King Hour has done the same. It loses 2% of its value every three months. So imagine you're changing, actually, your, your euros for King Hour. And, and you get a conversion of one to one. So you give 100 euros or 10 euros, and you get 10 king hours. After three months, your 10 king hours, or your 10, former 10 euros, are worth 2% less, unless you pay a little fee. What is the result of this? People don't want to hold to the money. They want to spend it. And when the time arrives to pay those 2% or to actually put the stamp, they spend it. On Wednesdays, which was the day they actually had to pay to put that stamp, everybody was looking for spending their money. And so we know from this and from the King Hour that that money circulates at a velocity, that's the proper term they use, at a velocity that is, in the King Hour's case, three times the velocity of Euro. So as a result, in the Bavaria region, we've seen an, an, an increase in trade and, and an increase also in social connections. Yeah. It's been such a successful uh, case that actually a, a network of other regio geld, local currencies, has been created or is actually blooming in, in the Germany, in German, Swiss, and Austrian, and Austrian region. It's called the regio geld currencies. There's another currency from the 30s that, has also inspired, that is also inspiring many of the currencies today, both in Italy and in France. And it's called the Veal. It's a currency, of whether the, while, while the world doesn't exist anymore because it was closed down by the, by the central bank, um, this one, the Veal, exists, exists since 34. It's actually, some economists have been looking at how many transactions in Switzerland happen with the Veal. And among SMEs, the small and medium enterprises in, in Switzerland, up to 25% of their transactions, internal transactions, happens in the VIV. So they've managed to create a network of businesses, because this, this currency is only for businesses. Citizens are not in. You have to be a business to actually be able to, to trade in VIV. Um, they've, they've managed to create a network of 62,000 businesses that trade a fourth of the transactions is made in VIV. Also, uh, digital uh, the mutual credit system. So they don't create a new currency in a way, paper-based like the previous one, but they do, they're creating a network of debits and credits, which they then, at, the, at, the, at particular times, they, they clear out. This bill has still exists today. Some argue that part, part of the reason of the <coughs> Swiss economic stability is thanks to the bill. And it's inspiring a network of currencies in Italy, the most known one of which also because it was the first is the Sardex in Sardinia, where up to uh, today, six, seven years after its creation, 3,200 businesses in the island are connected and trade in Sardex. Yeah, but it's also inspiring many, the Seoul network, as they call the Seoul movement in France. Also many businesses actually trading in their local currency. Um, those two, a mix of those two have been, or of those two traits, one that is a mutual credit currency and the other one that is perishable money that has a demurrage fee, that is money that loses value, face value at least, unless you do something with it, has arrived to Kenya. And in Kenya they are actually using communities that have traditionally been marginalized and stigmatized and outside the, the cores or the heart of the economic trade. Slums typically have started to have gone together 
as businesses and creating their own currency, which is also perishable. So at the end of the year, that money is not worth anything, not even a few cents. And they come together, they clear out their debts, and then they reissue money. So they are, in a way, taking back the power over the issuance of money. And what we see, studies here are very, very thorough. And what we see is that it's increasing in the level of trade in those neighborhoods within weeks. We see that the kids in those neighborhoods are eating better. And we see that even they are actually investing the savings they can do in the proper money. Because now they're spending this money. And they save in the, in the Kenyan shillings. Those savings are being spent in actually building the infrastructures of the neighborhood or investing in the businesses. Um, she asked me to give you examples of currencies that are risky uh, or that are not working as they maybe would like to do. And I'm going to give you an example that is, if you've heard of local currencies, mostly when I talk about them, the first one they say, oh, it's like in Bristol, the Bristol pound. Well, this is a currency that is, uh, has a monetary design that is a bit questionable. It's like the king hour in the sense that you can go into it and buy it. You can go with your sterling pound, in this case, and buy your Bristol pound. And it's a network of businesses that accept the Bristol pound. Uh, it's mainly the most known because the mayor of Bristol, the former mayor of Bristol, went out and said, well, I'm getting my 100% of my salary in Bristol pounds. I don't want sterling. I'm getting in Bristol pounds. So it was a strong institutional support. Um, and uh, and, it, and it, it's not only paper-based, which has given the community a strong sense of identity, but it's also a, it's, it's in your phone. Yeah, that's how it is. There is, and, and it's inspiring because it's so big, it's inspiring the network of currencies in the UK, they're called transition, transition town currencies. They are in, it's inspiring many of them yeah, across, across the UK. From Exeter to Totnes to Keeping to live with Liverpool. In London, there are a couple, many of them. The, the risk is that you have to be willing to spend good money, sterling. Good money in the sense that you can use it in Manchester, but you can use it in London, and you can use it in Liverpool to, to actually want to trade good money for bad money. Right? That's one of the things. And typically, there's the, the, for a person to be willing to do that, you first have to be convinced of the idea, so you're preaching to those who are already convinced. And the other one is you have to have a good economic stability to actually be willing to lose good money for, to change it for bad money. Yeah. So it leads to a higher fragmentation of the city into the haves and have nots. That's one of the risks. Uh, yeah. Let me get there. So what are we learning from today's um, community currencies. One is that they are extremely local, and they respond to local needs. They are designed by people that are concerned for particular social problems in their regions. And then they are designing the monetary systems to fit or to solve that problem. And I could give you more examples maybe in the break. Um, there's a lot of experimentation and innovation in monetary designs, not only in the technology, as you spoke. Some of these currencies, like particularly in the UK, are, are um, crypto-based. Many are paper-based, so all technologies, really. But they are experimenting with the monetary design. So from introducing a demurrage fee, the oxidation that I spoke about, to going to mixing both backed currencies, backed into euro, and, uh, and um, credit circles, so a mix of them, or actually backing the currencies with waste, which we could speak about later. So there's a lot of economic experimentation in monetary design. Most import importantly, there is, as people get into this, they may get at the beginning because it's fun, because it's local, because it's my neighborhood and I want to support the local business. But as people get into these new monetary systems, there is an increased and a growing awareness. There is, it's an educational, if you want, project where people start to learn and to understand money in a different way and start to question what money is and how it works and what are the effects of the way our money is designed onto our social relations. They're starting to realize that money is not just, but that it can be designed in different ways. The monetary system, not the bill itself, but that the monetary system can be designed for different purposes. And so communities are taking back the power over 
the thinking of money, and about the issuance of money, and about the use of money. Some cities, actually institutions, public institutions, with this increased awareness, are taking it back to actually design policies or to implement policies, environmental and social policies, that are supported by new forms of money. And you have the currencies in northern Barcelona, in uh, Santa Coloma de Gramanet, that is taking it back to actually work for a social cohesion. You have them in, in Lisbon and in actually in a series of cities in Portugal that are designing their local, very local, at the, at the level of neighborhood sometimes, monetary systems to actually support a more sustainable behavior in the citizens. Um, they, are, they, they are designing the local systems for implementing particular political goals. Now, it was the future of money, but it's really the future <coughs> of money is that the seminar should be talking about. And, and this is where, again, to, to, to emphasize this too, there's a lot of experimentation on monetary designs. There are monies. It's not just one money. And we're used to think about one money or one form of money. Now, this, this raised several questions. And one of them, the mainly, is that actually if people are taking power over the issuance of money, we need to know about it. We need to know about how money is created, who creates money, how does it circulate, how do we, security issues that you'll be talking about. But there is no time, there is no, in, there is interest, but there, there is a lot to learn. And what I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm giving the Mayura, which is a community currency that was launched last summer in Gothenburg, perishable for three months. It was a sort of, of citizens activist experiment. They wanted to see how the city reacted. Um, and they designed it following the Bristol pound model. So it was a backed currency. You could buy with your, you could go into the chain office with your 100 crowns and buy 100 Mayura. And, and that's it. And then you couldn't redeem it. Or if you redeem, you would get back to 95 crowns. And with the five, with the exchange, with the, with the difference, they would pay to local nonprofits or they would actually maintain the system, or cover the cost of the system. And the answer I, I spoke with Kali Carlson is the name of the, of the leading figure in that, in that initiative. And, and similar activists in Malmo, actually, and they come back to the same thing. Well, let's just do like they've done, because that's easy enough. Without realizing that then you're reproducing the very same problems that the Bristol Bank has. Yeah. Or when discussing the demurrage fee, which is proven uh, to actually really increase the velocity of money, they stand still and say, well, but that's not intuitive. How are we going to convince people about this? So the lack of knowledge is in itself a big barrier that uh, can hamper the enthusiasm of these practitioners. The other one is, what about taxes? Uh, and I love paying my taxes. <laughs> Uh, so how do we, and, and, and this is a discussion that can be answered here, uh, how do we think these monetary systems so that they are compatible with the taxing system? Or how do we think, rethink the taxing system so that it can in be included these sort of local currencies? And cities are working with this, so Lisbon has found their solution, Gramanet in northern Barcelona have found the solution. But since each monetary system is different because they are designed for local purposes, we need to rethink and to answer this question every time for every single one of them. There's no one answer fits it all. Yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, mitt namn är alltså Björn Segendorf. Jag arbetar som rådgivare på Riksbanken och har gjort det under ett antal år. Min roll har blivit mer och mer att uh, arbeta med uh, betalningsmarkt, uh, betalningsmarknadsrelaterade frågor. Uh, och det, det är ju uh, kontantlösa samhället, uh, um, strukturomvandlingen på ett betalningsmarknaden, uh, fintech, nya aktörer och nu också uh, digitala valutor och sånt. Um, och vi har ett ganska omfattande internationellt nätverk och det är väldigt nyttigt i det här sammanhanget. Och uh, ett par av de budskap som jag tänkte ni skulle plocka med er hem härifrån är att... Uh, Folk i allmänhet tror att vi har hunnit mycket längre än vad vi har gjort. Och det har vi inte. 
Eh, skälet till det är två egentligen. Va? Det är det att det här är helt ny mark så det finns ingen som man kan lära av utanför Sverige. Eh, och det betyder ungefär att ifall vi samlar folk i ett rum och så säger vi att nu så ska vi tala om eh, centralbanksutgiven digital valuta och det tycker alla är jättespännande och så börjar alla tala om totalt olika saker och så får man liksom inte ut någonting av den dialogen. Um, och det var därför som vi, vi påbörjade det här projektet i mars förra året och vi publicerade första rapporten i september och det var helt enkelt att sätta ner våra initiala tankar på papper så att vi har en utgångspunkt för en liksom strukturerad dialog med alla de intressenter som finns där och det är liksom så man ska se den rapporten. Det är alltså inget liksom sl slutligt tänk utan det är bara startpunkten för en ganska lång dialog. Och det andra är att eh, eh, när man talar digital valuta så kommer man lätt in på teknologi. Och eh, det brukar funka så här att alla säger, åh nu har vi en spännande teknologi och vad kan man möjligtvis göra med den? Och så har man liksom teknologisk lekstuga när man bygger saker. Eh, så tänkte vi att vi inte skulle göra det. Vi, vår ansats har liksom varit att Börja med att identifiera vilka problem är det som vi skulle vilja lösa med en digital valuta. Och hur ska den i sådana fall se ut? Och först därefter så kan man se vilken teknologi är mest lämpad för att faktiskt bygga den här saken. Och de här faktorerna tillsammans gör att liksom, det är först nu som vi har börjat ha en ute dialog med sig teknikföretag. Och det betyder att vi har liksom inte hunnit fullt så långt som alla tror att vi har. Och syftet med den här äh, presentationen då, det är helt enkelt att liksom berätta för er vad är det vi håller på med och hur ser tidsplanen ut ungefär. Jag skulle se om det funkar. Ja. Äh, den första moderna banksedeln gavs ut här i Stockholm för äh, lite drygt äh, 350 år sedan. Och äh, ja, sen, då, sen den tiden så äh, kan man säga att liksom sedlar och mynt har varit centralbankens produkt och här har vi en sån här S-kurva som brukar illustrera en produkts livscykel. Och, och ni känner alla igen den så jag tänkte inte förklara den mer och så gör vi så här. För att här har vi alltså nominella efterfrågan på sedlar och mynt i ett Sverige. Och det där är en misstänkt S-kurva va? Och vi befinner, oss, vi befinner oss till och med här nu ungefär. Och eh, vi, det här bara illustrerar att liksom, oavsett vad vi tycker om det så kontanter håller på att dö. Så enkelt är det. Mm. Uh, och eh, vi kan spekulera länge om varför det är så. Uh, jag ska inte ta upp tiden mer med det för att ni vet alla hur det liksom ser ut där ute. Uh, det här är däremot en väldigt svår sak att sälja när man är utomlands. Alltså tyskarna begriper inte det här. Så att vi har fått ägna väldigt mycket tid åt att liksom förklara att det finns goda skäl varför vi håller på med vad vi gör. Va? Så för en centralbank då så betyder det ju saker och ting när liksom kontanterna är på väg bort. Och ett kontantlöst samhälle är ju någonting som vi liksom måste tänka ganska noggrant på. Och ifall vi nu ska... Menar, det finns implikationer av det uh, och, och, de kom, och de kommer vi till här. Va? Men här uppe så ifall vi skulle trycka på startknappen idag och säga att nu ska vi bygga en e-krona. Då tar det ett par år att bygga den här saken. Och så ska du lansera den på marknaden och så ska den ta marknadsandelar och sen så börjar den leverera effekt. Och det betyder att liksom effekten ligger tio år bort. Så att ska vi designa någonting så kan vi inte designa det för att lösa de problem som vi ser på dagens marknad. Vi måste designa det för att lösa vad vi tror kommer vara bekymmer om sig tio år. Och då har vi försökt titta lite grann i vår um, kristallkula som var i ett väldigt mörkt valv nere på Riksbanken och det är massa hemliga riter kring när man ska använda den där. Men vi tror att det finns konkurrens på ett betalningsmarknaden och det gör det på ytan för det, det är det som är med att banker och klarna och inte alla de här jepparna som inte säljer betaltjänster. Tittar vi våningen under på, de tek, alltså på den tekniska infrastrukturen som då hanterar betalningsinstruktionerna 
så, så det ser man att det finns otroligt mycket single points of failure där. Eh, jag kan ge exempel. Va? De här, och det är faktiskt värre än så. Det är antagligen så att om inte tio år så har vi ingen svensk infrastruktur för att inte hantera betalningar på svensk mark. Kortsystemen idag, de är internationella. Där hanteras betalningarna i Belgien, UK och USA. Uh, vi har ju bankgirot som är då hubben i, 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 i till Sverige och när det gäller betalningar så ska ni ha klart för att allting handlar om nätverkseffekter och economics of scale. Och Sverige är ett litet land så att det finns ekonomiska skäl för att fundera på för bankerna om man inte ska förlägga den här verksamheten utomlands. Och min misstanke är att det kommer att ske förr eller senare och då står vi helt utan nationell infrastruktur för betalningar och då måste man fundera på vad ska vi tycka om det. Uh, sen så har vi ju den här lite latcho situationen att uh, via betaltjänstdirektivet så låter vi så licensierar vi icke banker att lite sälja betaltjänster. Samtidigt så via lag så förbjuder vi dem att ha tillgång till uh, betalningssystem. Så att de blir beroende av att ta bankerna som ombud där. Och det är kanske inte så begåvat ur en um, konkurrenssynpunkt. Så att uh, vi tror att liksom de här uh, konkurrensaspekterna här är också någonting som kan bli mer uttalade framöver. Uh, sen så är det ju klart att... Uh, när vi går mot det kontantliga samhället så kommer vissa grupper upp, alltså uppleva det som, som, ett bekymmer, som bekymmersamt och det är på goda grunder. Nu gäller inte det här bara betalningar va? utan att man får bekymmer då betyder ofta att man inte har tillgång eller kan använda sig av den digitala teknologin som vårt samhälle i ökad utsträckning bygger på. Och det är en digital exkludering. Uh, och det är någonting som vi ser att det här kommer bli mer och mer uh, bekymmersamt. Och sen har vi någonting som vi centralbanker tycker om och inte talar om. Nämligen vikten av att allmänheten har tillgång till riskfria likvida tillgångar i form av centralbankspengar. Och uh, uh, det finns skäl för att man kan liksom tycka att det här är bra och så. Men det här är de, men ifall kontanterna försvinner. Så har inte allmänheten det längre och då måste man ha en synpunkt på bör de ha det eller bör de inte ha det. För att som det är idag så tillhandahåller vi den här typen av pengar bara till bankerna. Men det här är ett antal saker som vi ser att det liksom kontantlösa samhället får oss att vi behöver ta ställning till det helt enkelt. Och då kan man fundera på vad kan en centralbanksutgiven digital valuta möjligtvis göra? För att det finns ju andra sätt att också attackera de här frågorna. Men att digital valuta, det är det sättet som vi vet minst av och som vi behöver lära oss mer om för att kunna på ett rationellt och vettigt sätt välja mellan de olika alternativ som finns. Men att vi ser ju då att ja, en CBDC kan då självfallet fungera som pengar och vi har gått igenom de här olika funktionerna. Uh, den ger ju, i och med att det är en fodran på Riksbanken så ger det ju folk, företag, myndigheter så tillgång till den här riskfria, likvida tillgången. Uh, men det här är då uh, en e-krona som betalningsmedel. Men en hel del av de positiva effekterna finns här nere, nämligen att bygga en digital valuta så måste du ha en IT-plattform för att också hantera den på. Det måste finnas kontostrukturer någonstans eller liksom register. Och du måste kunna föra den här från punkt A till punkt B. Och att det är, liksom, det är här vi ser att vi kan få effekter också. Nämligen att här så kan man ju bygga en kringväg runt de här single point of failure. Och eh, man kan också attackera de här konkurrensproblemen, men att det är svårt att tro att det här är en liksom silver bullet för att hjälpa de som drabbas av ett kontantligt samhälle, för att här bygger vi en liksom digital sak och det är svårt att tro att det med en digital lösning kan hjälpa de som är digitalt exkluderade. Mm. Uh, väldigt kort, vi som centralbank har ju ingen bra kontakt med Um, slutanvändarna. Vi vet ju inte exakt företagens behov, konsumenternas behov och så vidare. Så att den här 
figuren är bara för att liksom illustrera hur en betalning går till väldigt snabbt och vilken roll Riksbanken och marknaden kan ha. För att man initierar en betalning här, det är en elektronisk instruktion och den måste gå in i det här systemet någonstans. Va? Och att det kan ju vara vd i liksom mobilbank eller ditt kort eller, eller på något annat sätt. Men det finns, en, det, det finns en ingång där och det är de betaltjänster som har tillhandahåll. Och de måste lämpligtvis byggas av marknaden för de vet ju kundernas behov. Det gör inte vi. De, också, de har mycket bättre system för att vet, hantera vissa saker också. Sen så måste ju information verifieras och så vidare. Och sen så har vi då den här rutan. Det är den minsta rollen som en centralbank kan ha här. Nämligen att vi ger ut, vi eh, löser in och vi genomför betalningarna mellan två olika punkter här. Och sen så ska information gå tillbaka då till de som använder den här betaltjänsten. Så det här är vi, det här är liksom marknaden och här är allting som då behöver göras. Och någonstans här måste den här gula och den här bruna rutan mötas. Så det är de liksom frihetsgrader som vi har när det gäller vilka roller som olika aktörer kan ha här. Det här är väldigt kort, det är ett high level koncept som vi har sagt i ut i rapporten. En e-krona blir självfallet en fordran på Riksbanken. Den bör vara tillgänglig för alla aktörer i ekonomin. Vi tror att den först och främst bör vara konstruerad så att det är betalning på lägre värden. Alltså person till person, person till företag, eventuellt business to business. Men den är inte avsedd för stora betalningar mellan finansiella institutioner. För där har vi rikssystemet. Vi tror att den bör vara liksom kontobaserad. Eller bör finnas ett liksom register som ungefär funkar som konton. Och vi kompletterar det sen med en... Uh, värdebaserad historia, alltså att, 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 att du kan ladda ner sig värden på din uh, mobiltelefon och använda. Och ett skäl till det är nämligen det här att kan vi få till ett sätt att göra betalningar offline så skapar vi redundans. Det vill säga att går kommunikationen ner någonstans så kan du fortfarande köpa lite mat ute i Ica-butiken och du kan ute fortfarande köpa bränsle och det är väldigt bra ifall det är en kall vinterdag. Som lagen ser ut idag så tror vi inte att vi kan sätta ränta på det. Det är väl en öppen fråga sen ifall Riksbanksutredningen har någon annan synpunkt på det. Sätter man inte ränta på det så måste man överväga sätta kvantitativa restriktioner i alla fall för det finansiella institut. För i alla fall så kan det, kan det uppstå arbitragevillkor nämligen. Som sagt, det här är ingen ersättning för rikssystemet. De är väldigt olika. Och... Vi tror att man kan skapa partiell anonymitet och med det som menar jag att systemet måste veta allt för det måste finnas spårbarhet för liksom penningtvätt och den typen av saker. Men det, det är exempelvis inte alltid som betalningsmottagaren behöver veta vem avsändaren är så att man kan liksom partitionera informationen och ge, och ge olika access till den och på det sättet så kan man också upprätthålla viss form av anonymitet. Vi tror att... Eh, så alltså, vi tror att etableringen kommer gå långsamt för att vi har väldigt bra betaltjänster där ute. Det finns ingen unik egenskap med en e-krona som gör att folk verkligen skulle rusa till den. Och det är så att vi kan inte sätta ränta på den och om vi kan det så måste det bli en väldigt låg ränta. Bankerna kan ju höja räntan på sina, in, på sina in, äh, låningskonton och på det sättet behålla pengarna hos sig. Så att vi ser att vi kan bli liksom prissatta ut ur marknaden så att liksom etablering av en e-krona här, det blir en ganska svår sak. Så här ser tidsplanen ut. Vi håller nu på med fördjupade analyser kring ett antal frågor. Vi har, vi har dialog med teknikföretag. Vi kanske har möjlighet att lite börja med ett liksom proof of concept. Och, men i slutet av året här så måste direktionen säga bu eller bä. Ska vi fortsätta med arbetet eller ska vi avsluta det här? Och det är en öppen fråga helt enkelt för att det finns för- och nackdelar med den e-krona. Och det här är den sista bilden, det är min älskningsbild. Det är Nallepuv och Heffaklumpen. Och det går ju till på det sättet att Piglet, alltså Nasse, 
drömmer på natten om en stor konstigt djur som man aldrig har sett för det är stort och grått. Och på morgonen så att det ska Nalle Puv och han ut och liksom fångar den här saken. Så de gräver ett stort hål i vägen eh, för att vi inte fångar det. Men de vet ju inte vad det är och ingen har sett det. Och eh, E-kronan det är liksom Riksbankens häxaklump. För att ingen vet hur den ser ut. Alla tror att den är stor och grov och alla har en åsikt om den. Så att på det sättet så är det här ganska slående likt. Och sen så vet ni att nästa natt då så dyker det upp andra djur också. Det är wussels och grejer va. Och de ser jättekonstiga ut och eh, Nasse drömmer igen. Och det här illustrerar bara att lanserar man en e-krona och det gör det genom marknaden. När man har tagit locket av den här lådan, då lever den sitt eget liv. Och vi vet aldrig hur liksom slutresultatet de facto kommer att se ut. Oh, thank so thank you uh, for those of you who attended our last seminar you know that we ended in this kind of uh, okay cash will disappear but what will happen kind of frustration and people started talking about the e crown and cryptocurrencies questions about that came up so I'm very happy that we got three different scenarios uh, maybe or three different types of scenarios for a future currency <coughs> described to us in a very uh, brief uh, manner um, and I have a few questions about this and I hope and also if you uh, oh, uh, the, the others have have answers and you have questions to each other um, please ask them I was uh, thinking about the first question is to Este and it's about um, you asked about the local cur or you talked about the local currencies uh, and some of them were not so successful and some of them were very successful mm -hmm. But I was wondering, why do you use a local currency? About the Kimgawis, for example. 600,000 people are using it. Yeah. And why? When we have the digital crowns and digital currencies coming in, it's super fast with the banks. You know, what, what, what is the political drive? Why? So one of the, 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 they call it the, the bucket leaking money so there is that's one of the main reasons why many cities and citizen groups in the uk mainly are actually launching their own community currencies mm. even in a for a sterling pound currency that is rather limited in i mean if it's paper based of course um and it's it's that the, there was a study last year in santa coloma de gramanet santa coloma is a city of about three hundred thousand citizens north of Barcelona and it's it's Barcelona has become so so big that many of the people that actually sleep or live in Santa Coloma are work in um, in Barcelona so they do their shopping when they get out of work in Barcelona so what happens in Santa Coloma is that the money never stays there because people do their spending mm. in Barcelona and the study looked at how long does a euro stay in Santa Coloma when introduced mm. so they looked at how social money or the you know social welfare money how long did it stay in santa coloma and stay there for two to three days that's how long the money the new money mm -hmm. in it, it, it left it leaked out of it and that's one of the reasons why they actually come with the local currency mm -hmm. because it's money that you cannot use in barcelona you can only use in santa coloma so it's to stimulate is stimulate consumption in smaller in, the, places. in the smaller places and so the, the what we're seeing is that the local shops that are setting mm -hmm. are seeing their sales grow but the Kim Gower was in a... The Kim Gower is in a region, but... Oh, in a region. In, in a region, but it's, again, it's not the whole of Germany. It is, it's a smaller region. But, it, it, but the main reason is actually to stay, to yeah. help it be local, or stay yeah. in the region, yeah. and then to increase the circulation. To yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Sure. Uh, I think you also uh, identified essentially a cold start problem. What, what is the incentive to um, adopt it in the first place? Mm. And in the cryptocurrency and token market, they've dealt with this cold start pro uh, problem in two ways. The one is that they sell tokens or currencies initially at a hugely discounted price mm -hmm. to, a, to encourage early adoption. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is that they do what is called a coin drop, where they just, you know, here we go, have some free coins, um, and in that way hope to get people to, to adopt, um, which then has all these positive social benefits, but you overcome the cold start problem. Um, so that's just interesting from some of the private, yeah. Yeah, private so bit, yeah. yeah Bitcoin-y. So you hear about Bjorn, you hear about this. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about as a central bank uh, representative? 
som en, som en ekonom så är det lite svårt att förstå varför man använder lokala valutor. Vi har ju hört ett par skäl, men att liksom pengar, det är standardisering, det är mm. nätverkseffekter och så vidare. Det är det som ger pengarna användbara och inte skapar likviditet. Nämligen att du kan använda dem också utanför den här mer begränsade regionala delen. Och att det är det som är bakom euron, att man kan använda det i en stor mängd länder. Och då så säger det mig att är det så att man trots en nationell valuta har de här standardiseringen, nätverkseffekterna och det att man ändå skapar en liksom lokal valuta, då är det någonting med landet institutioner som inte fungerar. Att man kan inte tillhandahålla medborgarna riktigt vad de behöver. Mm. Och men, Venezuela är ju ett exempel man skulle kunna tänka på där. Mm. Och vad har hänt där? Can, maybe mm. some of you want to explain about the Venezuela situation. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so for, for various political reasons, uh, Venezuela lost access to international capital markets or nobody wanted to invest in them because they had defaulted on so many debts. Uh, and so what they did was they wanted to persuade people from the crypto and digital currency uh, space to essentially invest in Venezuela. And they did that by launching their own uh, cryptocurrency and by selling ostensibly at a reduced price a whole lot of these new Venezuelan petrodollars. Um, and in that way, they would obtain foreign capital, not through traditional institutions like the IMF or other governments, but from everybody jumping on the cryptocurrency hype. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't yeah. say the problems with it, but, but <laughs> as a description, that is essentially what happened. And that was last week. Uh, they've been talking about it for some time, but in principle, it was launched last week. When they launched it, they hadn't decide, decided yet which technical infrastructure they were using. Um, they couldn't tell you how they were guaranteeing the cryptocurrency that they were issuing. Um, they said that it was a petrodollar linked to oil output. Um, they hadn't shown the link. All that they said was, we promise we're going to peg it to oil output, which was what they had told international capital markets uh, in previous mm. years, and nobody believed them anyway. So, uh, so it's a yeah, it's a cool proof of concept, but they didn't do it very well. Uh, <laughs> so luckily, uh, the Swedish Riksbank is not in that situation. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I still want to ask you, Björn, where did the inspiration? You're the first Riksbank or a central bank in in the world. You said. Uh, doing this kind of uh, project and where did inspiration come you know it's close to to mind the thing that you were kind of uh, inspired by the crypto currencies and the no, technology this is, det här har ju ingenting med liksom kryptovaluta eller den teknologin att göra utan det har att göra med att vi har ett liksom nationellt uh, problem mm. som vi, som vi uh, måste förhålla oss till och det är att liksom kontanterna håller på att dö så mm. enkelt är det och vi ser samma sak i Norge och Norge har också börjat jobba på det här men de är lite mindre öppna med vad de pysslar med. Uh, vi har sett att uh, Uruguay har också, de har lanserat en ett, ett, um, pilot alldeles nyligen. Uh, men, det, men det är ju för då, då vill ju de lösa någonting annat, nämligen liksom finansiell inkludering. Mm. Då är det det som de vill uh, göra. Så att uh, en, det finns en del länder som liksom tittar på det. Uh, utifrån olika motiv, men det är ingen egentligen som har riktigt så bråttom som vi har. Så att, uh, det är Varför därför är det vi är så? mycket mer liksom tillämpade. Det är för att inte kontanten håller på att dö. Mm. I Sverige? Ja. Mm. Och vad är problemet med det? Så problemet är dels, det är delvis en ute, um, politisk fråga, för det är liksom både statens roll på ett betalningsmarknaden men det är ju inte mera för ett lagstiftning att liksom titta på. Men att vi behöver ju liksom förhålla oss till, ifall inte kontanterna finns, hur betalar man då i en ute nödsituation, till exempel. Det, det är ju liksom nationella suveränitetsaspekter och att vi talar också det här med liksom, Givet den omvärldsutveckling som vi ser, behövs det en nationell infrastruktur för betalningar eller inte? Så att det, så att det finns ett antal liksom frågor som inte måste upp på bordet. Sen i liksom slutet av dagen så kanske vi finner att nej, men det är inte är liksom starka motiv nog för att inte bygga en e-krona. Men att vi kan inte bara stå och sova utan vi måste liksom förhålla oss till detta. You mentioned really briefly before also that this will solve some problems. But there are problems that won't be solved, like the inequality problems, the digitally excluded, that's what you call them. 
And also, does this give rise to new problems? En, 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 en aspekt som ofta kommer upp är ju eh, det här med bank runs. Nämligen att ifall folk börjar eh, misstro de inte svenska bankerna så kan eh, eh, folk snabbt ta ut sina pengar och mm. liksom sätta dem hos Riksbanken och det skapar då lite instabilitet i det banksystemet. Mm. Eh, det är på sätt och vis är rätt. Vi, vi bör ha klart för oss att den individuella banken är utsatt för det redan idag. Jag menar, litar inte jag på ett min bank så går jag in på ett internetbankkontoret och så får jag över pengarna till en annan bank. Och det går ungefär lika fort. Mm. Men, men en e-krona skulle ju möjligtvis kunna göra, alltså skapa möjlighet för, för en bankrun på hela det svenska banksystemet. Och det är ju lite annorlunda naturligtvis. Nu så kan ju jag som EU-medborgare öppna bankkonto i sig liksom Tyskland mm. ifall jag litar mer på den lite, tyska staten och får över pengarna dit. Så att det är lite oklart liksom hur kritiskt det här bankrun-scenariet beror på en e-krona. Sen så finns det en liksom politisk fråga här också. Det är nämligen att ifall den svenska banksektorn skulle vara i så dåligt skick att folk inte litar på den. Vad är då statens jobb? Ska vi försöka låsa in medborgarna i den banksektorn eller ska vi tillhandahålla en liksom säker likvid tillgång som de kan fly till? Mm. And there are questions already. I just wanted to ask Claire a question before we, we, we start the Q&A. And it's about this cryptocurrency. So when I looked at this, is it really a currency? Both of you, Esther and Björn, talked about these three criteria for a currency. It's the storage of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. And there is a criticism towards the cryptocurrencies that it's not really a medium of exchange. People invest in it. But can it, is it really a currency? <laughs> It depends on the currency. Um, some, some of, so, so as Esther identified, you have these conflicting behaviors. Um, the fact that you can spend them means that, or that they have some value means that some people just sit on them. Um, and then, then you have the Bitcoin situation, where in principle you can buy things with them, but people just sit on them, um, and there are large transactions which create volatility. And so that's more commodity-like. But then you have other ones that, um, are used for such small things. So for example, micropayments to support bloggers. Mm. Um, and those become a payment system because people interact with them differently. So there's no hard and fast answer. Um, it's uh, It sort of evolves and, and is this unexpected emergent thing. You can, you know, it could go either way, right? Mm. Um, although there were certainly design considerations. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let the audience have, and please also, um, Keep your uh, questions short and uh, with a question mark at the end. <laughs> and if you have a specific question to one of the speakers, <coughs> Thank you, Ellis Wallner. Thank you for three excellent and very informative presentations. I'm a novice in this area, and I'm still trying to understand the need for these alternatives. I see the two things, the depression when the currency failed and you had to have something else. Even food stamps are used by people in the US uh, between each other, and, and the um, I'm forgetting now what the second thing was, but I still don't, yeah, illegal transactions uh, for narcotics, for uh, money laundering, and so on. But how do, don't we have an e-currency today? I mean, I, I have very little in my wallet. Everything is in my internet bank, and I make transfers directly, and I use my credit cards, and I use Swish, and the problem for those, and the pensioners groups are definitely uh, worried about the elimination of cash. But how would the e-currency help them because they'd have the same problem. They'd have to use internet. You want to I, I want to say something because I see your question connected to his question. So what's the problem with the, you know, why? And in a way, um, the Inge, the director of the Riksbanken, uh, last week, I think it was, had a, had a an article on, on, on Dagens Nyheter, where he actually said that uh, at the moment, um, and there are studies about this in the UK mainly, actually uh, most of our money circulating or the, uh, the monitor is actually commercial banks. Is the, is the commercial banks that have created it. And so actually the issuance of, our, the, of the majority of our money is in the hands of private actors, right? Mm. And as I see the e-krona project, is an effort for, by the central bank to take back power over the national money. 
In, in the UK, 97% of the money circulating, 97% of the money circulating is commercial bank money. We create it when we enter into a bank office, ask for a mortgage, they type in the figure in your bank account, and at that moment, they create the money. It's not that they go into the vaults and see where the money exists. And actually having the issues of money in private hands is both an ideological question, but it's also a practical question. <laughs> yeah. Can a bank loan out pengar som de inte har täckning för? Det är det du antyder, tycker jag. So at the moment, <laughs> you can ask that. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, this is very complicated. I can't say that 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 there is an excellent book, excellent <laughs> book, written by NEF, by the New Economics Foundation, based in the UK, the London School of Economics associated to it, and a, 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 a larger, a growing number of economists actually associated to it. It's called Where Does Money Come From? Mm -hmm. Freely downloadable on the internet. Just Where Does Money Come From? NEF, the N New Economics Foundation. And, and it'll give you a few surprises of where actually, how much tech nin, uh, banks have uh, about all this. Can I add a tiny last thing? Tiny so, last thing. Uh, regarding the perceived or the failure of existing payment infrastructures, I think it is a especially Swedish thing to trust the state and to trust private actors as much as we do. Mm. Um, it's actually the opposite way around in the rest yeah. of the world. Um, and, and so that is actually a failure of infrastructure. When you don't trust the infrastructure yeah. and you'd rather do it in a peer-to-peer -peer way, that's a failure. Um, the other thing is also that uh, existing financial infrastructures are islands. You have Sweden, you have Europe, um, and the connections to the US, but also to China and to developing countries are very poor. Um, and that creates an incentive for the creation of new infrastructures because the existing infrastructures don't actually cut mm. it in an international market. Um, mm. Can I just, I didn't get an answer to the question of how e-currency would help the large group of elderly who feel they are not digital, they're okay. not connected. So uh, I tried to say in my uh, presentation, I think it would be to uh, overselling the digital currency to say that it actually would on a broad scale help them. Uh, because it's a digital thing and we're talking about people who somehow are digi uh, digitally excluded. However, uh, if an e-corona is launched, uh, of course, I mean, the Riks Bank would have an ownership of it and you could, of course, uh, allocate some money in trying to build specific tools for helping specific groups. That you could do. But to say that this will be a silver bullet that helps all of them out there, that is, that's an oversell. Okay. Another question? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's very important to create uh, accessible tools even for uh, blind and other disabled people. Swish today works, but we don't know how the future uh, looks. So it's a very important question when, if creating an e crown. More questions? Everything is crystal clear. I have uh, something I'd like to say to Bjorn. I mean, he, he, you actually said in your, as an answer to your questions, I think you don't understand why local currency, sorry, yes, thank you. Why local, why, why there should be at all a local currency, that that is in a way a sign of a failing national currency. We rather have a standardized uh, unit of, or a standardized money than this variety of local. And I'd like to answer with your presentation, actually, where you started by saying, we don't have this technology and then want to use it. However, we actually look first at the problem and then develop the solution, see whether this is the solution to our problem. Local currencies do the same. They say, look, national currency is not helping us at the moment. It's not that they, we want it away from our lives. We want it, but let's have it as a store of value. Now, in our particular city, we have this problem that we want to solve with 
in a different way because the national currency is not solving it. And so mm -hmm. they look into the monetary design that would solve that problem. So they actually call, they say, we are a complementary currency, not yeah. a substitute currency. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So they'll, you have different layers, if you want, of currencies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? True. Uh, <laughs> but uh, just, just to <coughs> try to... Um, I mean, if you read history, you can see that uh, uh, when the king issued coins, uh, the, in uh, um, Sweden on average, I think that the metal value in the coin were 85% of the um, nominal value. And the, when, the, when, uh, the, uh, uh, when the banknotes were issued, they also served at the uh, premium com uh, compared to copper coin because they were much easier to carry around and so on. So yeah. people are obviously prepared to pay for network effect standardization. Mm. So having to complement them with something else tells you that th there is a kind of, you know, severe problem here. Then, of course, it can be like, uh, like in Spain that you want to keep spending in your s local um, this, um, this society and then you put some kind of tax on the uh, surrounding region by issuing this uh, regional... Yeah. But it is also, the problem is in the very, the problem and the strength. So standardization yeah. is a strength in itself. Yeah. I totally agree. It allows us to trade among each other in larger geographical areas. But it is a problem too. And look at the euro. So the yeah. actual financial, the, the, the financial crisis has shown that the euro is a currency that is designed for a big geographical area. But actually the problem is that mm. Spain, Greece, Portugal have mm. nothing mm. to do with the issues that Germany or the, or, not the UK, but, uh, but, but uh, or France are having or, Right? And so we are having one solution for a multitude of problems. Yeah. So mm. uh, standardization is good, but it has its weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so would all local currencies uh, disappear if the, the euro worked perfectly? I don't think so. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but you raised an important question about complementarity um, and, uh, and uh, a substitute. Uh, and what about cryptocurrencies? Do you feel? What are the, because you mentioned like eight different types of people <laughs> who had and dealt with bitcoins. Yeah. Is, is, what is the sentiment in the community? Is it? Uh, uh, I mean, it's so heterogeneous, there's no one answer. Um, there, there are some uh, that purport to be substitutes. Um, so Bitcoin purported to be a substitute right at the outset. There are others that are like that. Um, but if you looked at that, that HDAC that I showed you for, for the Internet of Things, that is a currency, a local currency either, mm. but it only operates within a special Internet of Things system. Um, mm. And so it is a complement to any kind of, I mean, you couldn't spend euros or not very easily in that system. And in that way, it's a complement. So it's a, it's a wide variety and the heterogeneity of the ideologies involved are what has led to that. Um, and the freedom that you can repurpose the intellectual property has, has enabled it as well. But isn't it so also that there's a cap within the system of, because it's very slow, right? It depends on the, the system. The blockchain. Well, there well, are from my understanding, you yeah. need verifications from at least six other actors, and it takes one hour per transaction to go through. Isn't there a limit to how big a system uh, this can be? So, so there are multiple blockchains. Um, that is partially true of the Bitcoin blockchain, um, mm. although the transactions that are occurring now are far fewer. So in December, for instance, it took 15 minutes to verify one Bitcoin transaction. Um, today, we're back down to five minutes because there's fewer transactions. Mm -hmm. But there are multiple different blockchain infrastructures, uh, depending on the different system that you build. And there are also overlays onto the Bitcoin system. So you can, you know, if you think of it as being a blockchain as like a little ring of process, you can build little processes over that, so kind of side rings um, or additional networks, and, and that creates uh, additional speed, additional possibilities. Um, mm. but, but I'm glad that you brought up the question of the blockchain, because there isn't a blockchain. There are multiple ones uh, controlled and created by different actors with different incentives and motives. Okay. We have um, a question in the back. Yeah, it's a short question. I think it's directed to Esther primarily. Uh, I'm thinking about whether or not these local currencies are, so to speak, from a political, ideological point of view, against the system or just lubricating the existing system. Because uh, the way that you describe them, they, they seem to be very short-term oriented. They sort of foster uh, uh, sort of transactions uh, 
on a year-to-year -year basis, so to speak. But I mean, the finance, we also need investments in the long term. And, and uh, aren't we then uh, directed towards the financial systems? And, and so do you understand my question, do. sort of? Uh, I do. Are, are, they, are they just ways of lubricating uh, local uh, transactions and consumption uh, within an existing system? Mm. Or are there, uh, uh, should we see them, or do you see them as sort of uh, a form of resistance? Mm. So um, there is not a single, I mean, it's almost your answer. It is not a single answer to that question. I can tell you that some of them, I can tell you what they say, the practitioners, and then I can tell you my view, okay? So some of them, uh, the, 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 the practitioners leading these local currencies, so each of them, come from all over the ideological scale. So you have the libertarian anarchists that want to construct an um, economy outside the establishment, and particularly after the financial crisis. And you have Faircoin, so, which is a crypto-based local currency with its core in, in the Catalonian region, but actually it's a global currency in that way. But it's a community in the sense that they are building a co-op-based. They take decisions over the monetary system on a general assembly basis, actually. So it's a co-op-based um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and they'll tell you, we are against the system. It's, it's, it's not only resistance, it's actually an alternative. It's not just against it, it's we are developing it. Whereas you have many others, the majority, I would say, actually, of, of the people that, um, they are both paper-based and digital-based, but the majority of them say, we don't want the system away. We need a currency to store value with. This currency is for s spending. Right, and so if we only if, if we if we only had our currency, the system wouldn't work either. It's really a complementary currency, right? And, and w because we cannot have several functions in one, and as, as we saw, it, it fosters contradictory behaviors. So it's actually as uh, and the, the current system they would tell you doesn't work already. Let's offer several currencies so that we can split the functions into different currencies. My take. It's a bit your answer. It's if taken this way, not as a resistant libertarian anarchist ideology, but more pragmatic, I think it, 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 it can lead to lubricating the system where people can, we saw it after the financial crisis in Madrid. People were saving their coffee, you know, every morning in Spain, you go out at 11 and spend your coffee, you know, your coffee morning, you take your zig and then you speak about whatever. And well, people started saving that. Within one year, 3,000, almost 3,000 3, bars and cafeterias closed down only in Madrid. That little saving, if you instead could spend it in the local currency, you would save your euros. And so in a sense, it lubricates the system. Yeah. One more question here, and then the lady behind. Thank you. A follow-up on the Barcelona and the other uh, residential city where they commute to Barcelona. I don't see how a local currency would help that in that other community because those people who are commuting to work in Barcelona, they would still, if it's convenient for them, do their grocery shopping and other shopping in Barcelona before returning home. So I don't really see how that helped local businesses in uh, that other city. Well, what we've seen, it was launched in uh, July. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm lying. It was launched in May 2017, so not even a year ago. And local businesses are already saying that that sales have gone up, what? and that customer loyalty, mm. big, big, because when traded, is this increasing in awareness? Then people start. You know, you go to Barcelona, you spend your money, and you don't give a thought about money and the effects of your spending. Your spending, where you decide to spend your money, has social and economic effects. People start thinking about it, and this r increasing awareness of what money is and the and how we spend it is changing people's behavior. Please, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I'm wondering about digital identities. Uh, considering that we may, you know, exchange various digital assets on various platforms in the future, um, wha how? What do you think about the current health I or digital IDs and login procedures? Hold the mic closer to. Sorry. You. Yeah. Um, what ways forward do you see to secure our digital identities in these future markets? Have you seen any? Is it a question for the whole yeah. panel, or yeah. for yeah. Yeah. examples from the 
blockchain <laughs> world. Um, um, you are thinking about it. Uh, so, so it depends what you mean by securing digital identity. So, it ne I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a digital security expert, and I'm certainly not an expert on healthcare. Uh, but, uh, but if I look at what is happening within the financial system, what is happening is that people are more worried about their data being changed uh, than they are about <coughs> some metadata being available. And so the blockchain system prevents changing of people's uh, data, uh, whether for human through human error or through, uh, through malice. Um, and potentially, one could conceive of a blockchain-based system where sufficient information is made public to verify that a transaction has occurred, but the content of the transaction need not be public. So for example, um, the fact that I have gone to the doctor and paid for my doctor's visit may be publicly available, but the fact that I have some grievous life-threatening illness or not is not publicly available. The question then becomes how much information is too much information. Mm. Um, and we've already seen that this, this metadata, information about information, when aggregated and when enough of it is publicly available, can be just as threatening to individual integrity as if the actual content was revealed. Um, so by analogy, multiple doctor vi visits, um, ergo there is a critical illness. Uh, and I don't have an answer for that, um, and, and I don't know who does. It's, it is very difficult. It's a trade-off between the convenience of the system, um, which, which is huge, and the, the pe possible threat to individual integrity, um, which comes as a consequence. Any more? Um, okay, um, I think you're into a key question here because uh, how we identify ourselves and how we uh, digitally sign agreements mm. and so on uh, will be a key issue. And uh, we have the bank ID solution here in uh, Sweden, which works fine. Uh, and uh, on the EU level, there are work on the uh, IE does. It's a uh, directive regulating identification services and so on. But this will, of course, be a S this must work, otherwise nothing else will uh, work either. And here we are in a way, um, have to rely on uh, cryptography. And uh, it's a race between, you know, keeping it safe and those who have incentive to manipulate these things. So it's, so, so it's like banknotes in that way. You always have to increase the safety and the community technology that allows people to forge them more easily and cheaper. Uh, maybe one dimension that we haven't really talked about is whether identification will be central or uh, decentralized in the mm -hmm. sense that the bank ID is a centralized st uh, solution where they look up your signature towards a uh, central register. But you can also think about when is it sufficient to have a local uh, uh, identification, like your smartphone recognize your face, and uh, that is uh, enough to uh, uh, identify yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have any good answers, really, but you, I think you're into something here. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So that was the perfect. Uh, ending note because our next seminar will be about security and currency. <laughs> 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 about digital security, what happens yeah. if a great power in the East might come into the Riksbank server and hack all the e-crowns, for example, all of these scenarios, mm. people are very creative coming up with scenarios, so we're going to discuss them next time. Uh, I am uh, very happy that you came, but before you start packing up your things, I'm going to ask one final question to the panelists. And I've told them they only get one sentence to answer this question. Very difficult for researchers to keep to one sentence. And you will hear on the one hand, on the other, <laughs> no. So this is a challenge for them more than for you. How do you think that the currency supply in Sweden will look like in 10 years? I, I, I think that there will be multiple parallel systems. Um, that will necessarily have to be able to 
converse or transfer among each other, uh, but Sweden still needs to be part of the global system, and perhaps there are local problems in Sweden that necessitate some sort of either local currency or digital currency or both. Um, so that's what I see probably in 10 years, multiple parallel local systems. Local currency, do you mean a crown? Or do you mean other types of... Um, so, so local being defined not by geographic boundaries, but by interest boundaries. So for example, I mentioned Steam as a currency which you use to pay interna international bloggers micropayments for their content. Um, that is something that uh, transcends borders, but is a local currency for those actors. And I think that we need to have things like that, particularly in the digital world, not just uh, digital crowns. Uh, although I do think that the Riksbank, I, I, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Long yeah. sentence, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Esther. I'll, I'll shut it down because I think your answer is actually, it's also my answer. I think we'll, we'll have, um, I don't know whether within 10 years or a bit longer, but we'll have a, layers of currencies, each of them, a, a national currency that is also, you know, globally recognized, and, but, 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 but layers in the sense that there, there might be currencies that are interest-based for groups with interests, that are all over Sweden, but also others that are regional, and, and I mean really regional, at the level of the city and even, even of neighborhoods actually um, based, where citizens are issuing their own currency for their own community, community building within their own geography. Okay, um, jag skulle det lätt för mig att eftersom kontanterna är på väg bort så kommer vår tillgång till pengar i allt ökande utsträckning vara digital. Mm. <laughs> There we go, don't crack the research. <laughs>